It's my pleasure tonight to talk to you for a minute about um, the volunteering and my job as chairman of the Aurora Awards Committee. I'm not sure that I see myself on the screen, Peter, but it doesn't really make any difference. I can still talk. Um, Aurora is a volunteer organization. It's uh, manned, and it's personed by everyone who volunteers. And the, the job that I've enjoyed most has been part of the awards committee. I've been chairman for the past three years. And um, we, it's a great job because I get to help recognize the people who are um, making a difference in rock art. Uh, we have um, information on the website, which you visited to uh, register for this lecture. So you can go there and you can see links about volunteering and about the chairmanship, uh, ab about the volunteer uh, uh, possibilities. We have awards, the Wellman Award and the Bach Award for um, lifetime achievements. We have um, the Conservation and Preservation Award, which is pretty obvious what that's for. We also have the Castellan Award for New Research and the Education Award. Arar also has a special award called the Oliver Award, Oliver Award, which was um, started from a photographer and it recognizes uh, the art and science of photography in the service and study and appreciation of rock art. Tonight's speaker, Jeff, won this award in 2017. Jeff has been involved in documentation, site stewardship, and conservation projects for 20 years, including projects in Australia. He's given talks at international conferences, Arara conferences, and elsewhere. And he's currently finishing up a book called Rock Art of the World, Ancient Imagery of Power, Ritual, and Story. I met Jeff in Cairo in 2007, at the start of a very challenging trip uh, into the Sahara, where the temperatures ranged from 32 degrees to 108 degrees over approximately 10 days. Uh, I know he goes to great uh, lengths to achieve his photographs because one of my favorite uh, photographs at my house is one that he took on a nighttime winter trip to Three Rivers, New Mexico, where he had to use hand warmers to keep his um, camera working. Uh, now he's going to take us on another extreme adventure with his presentation on the rock art of Colombia. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Margliff. Okay, are we in business? Can everybody see You're that? You're good. All right, great. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry to report that I was not able to get my cat filter to work. So you're gonna just have to look at me or hopefully more the photos. Um, initially, I wanna thank Aurora and the board for inviting me to speak. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I also just wanted to take a moment to recognize the sad passing of Aurora founding member, Daniel McCarthy. Um, Dan made great contributions to rock art and to the Native American community, and he will certainly be missed. So just after Thanksgiving 2020, I was surprised to start getting emails from just about everyone I knew, uh, including my mom, uh, telling me about the new discovery of eight miles of painted Ice Age rock art in the Amazon, including uh, uh, depictions of giant extinct animals known as megafauna. Okay. So uh, I started to get these, these emails and started to get a viral news feed, like probably many of you did as well. This was just after Thanksgiving, just a couple months ago. So uh, the Sistine Chapel was one of the things that were in a lot of the headlines. 
Um, so here's another example of the viral news feed. This is from the BBC. This one talks about a treasure trove of, of discoveries of megafauna in the Amazon. From CNN, Ice Age beasts found in the Amazon. This one talks about ultra realistic ancient rock paintings being found. Um, so this is another one that came through. Um, so I, like many of you, were, were very skeptical and I was surprised to um, uh, hear about these claims. And I was especially surprised because I had just been to the Colombian Amazon and I had just been to many of these sites. In fact, I had been to the same sites that were shown in, in uh, these articles. Um, and even what made me even more skeptical is I had been with some experts, uh, including two PhDs from the United States, as well as two Colombian experts, and none of these people interpreted these sites the way they were being interpreted in the news media. And just to be clear, the discoveries, the new discovery that was alleged in the media came about in an article in Quaternary International by a British and Colombian team uh, that came out in 2020 that had made this new alleged discovery. But if you looked at the viral nature of the story, over a hundred articles came out on the web within just a couple of days. And if you looked a little deeper, you could see that it became obvious that a lot of the viral hype was coming to promote uh, a documentary that was on Channel 4 in England called Jungle Mystery, Lost Kingdoms of the Amazon. So let's back up just a little bit. For the January 2020 trip, I had the good fortune to go with John and Mavis Greer. This is John, this is Mavis. Besides being very nice people, they are experts about all things rock art. They're particularly experienced in Central America and South America. As just about probably everybody on here knows, uh, Mavis is a PhD and a uh, past president of Aurora. Uh, John is a PhD. And then we, and they also, as part of their expertise about South and Central America, uh, John got his PhD working on the Orinoco River in Venezuela uh, and Colombian border that's not far from the Serrania La Landosa. And he actually wrote the Lowland South America chapter in the Handbook of Rock Art Research. So we were also lucky, and I'm forever grateful for the help of HEPRI, uh, which is the Colombian rock art investigation team based out of Bogota, uh, the group for the investigation of indigenous uh, rock art. And Judith Trujillo here and Guillermo Munoz and Carlos Martinez were especially helpful to, to us. And they do great work as I'll explain below. Guillermo and Judith have their masters in rock art and Judith is actually working on um, her PhD on rock art of the Suania La Lindosa at the present. I'm getting the problem again. There we go. I think it's lagging with the connection. Um, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, maybe a bandwidth thing. So uh, this is Colombia, which is a beautiful, gorgeous country. It has a variety of ecosystems, a treasure trove of great rock art. The Andes are a dominant feature and they kind of run that way. And then you have the Amazon River down here and you have the Orinoco River up here. And kind of the border of Amazonia runs this way. And the Serrania La Lindosa is down here. Um, we yeah, saw, yeah. so this is uh, shows some rock art concentrations in uh, Colombia. We initially were in the Bogota area on the Altiplano of the Andes. Then we went to Guaviare, which is where the Serrano La Lindosa is. And then this is where the Chiribiquetti area is, which has amazing rock art also. So just to give you a little bit of example of contrasting rock art, this is in the Altiplano. These are petroglyphs. There's a lot of 
petroglyphs in the Altiplano, uh, where there's not much in the Serrano La Mundosa. Uh, this is a place called Chunho, an archaeological park in the Altiplano, and one of the paintings that you can see there. And then more petroglyphs by way of contrast in the Altiplano, and even lots of cupules with these digitated uh, anthropomorphs, which is just for people who don't study rock art, a fancy way of saying uh, somebody where you can see the digits of their hand. So, okay, now on to the Serrania La Lindosa. Um, this is kind of on the edge of Amazonia. And it's to give you a little context, it's an area that really has only opened up for research uh, primarily in the last few years. And that's because this area has been hard to access for outsiders until 2016, when there was a very fragile peace agreement between the leftist guerrillas, the FARC, and the government. And for decades before that, this area was extremely dangerous with fighting between right-wing we were even told that the decades of civil war. Um, so this is Rudal, which is where one of the three main rock art concentrations is at. And, and according season so we plan to go in the dry it still rained a lot uh, and it rained pretty much every day we were there at least intermittently um, and uh, Colombia has beautiful plants great flora this is just one example um, there's also an amazing array of biodiversity uh, in Colombia in general but especially in the Amazon and this is just one beautiful example um, the trails, to give you an idea of what it's like to get to the sites, these are cut trails, um, but it's still, it's still pretty wet and there's a lot of plant growth. So let me give you a little background about the main sites. So this is a map from Hebrew to give you an idea. This is the, the Serrania La Lindosa and it's about 20, I don't know, 20 miles or so long. Uh, and I put stars on. So this is the Nueva Tolima site complex. This is Cerro Pinturas and Cerro Azul. And this is Rudal. Um, and then uh, the, the, the primary complex is, this is Cerro Pinturas, which is just an incredible site. And it contains the Cerro Azul site, which is right in here, kind of at the base of the cliff. And then I'll show you at the top level, is almost continuously painted in one of the largest rock art sites I've ever seen anywhere in the world. So this is the Sierra Azul uh, panel, the primary panel there. It's, it's a big site and there's a lot more rock art than just in this photo. Um, this has gotten very famous in the last two months with all the viral hype about it, but it was already getting famous anyway, and partly because of its mural-like composition which you don't see that often in rock art. And it's just obviously spectacular. Um, Cerro Pinturas, this whole site complex is one of the most exceptional rock art concentrations in the world. It's got multiple panels of elaborate and well-preserved paintings uh, and what in the US we call pictographs. Um, it's an amazing uh, combination of both figurative and, and non-figurative rock art including geometrics. Uh, and you don't always usually get that kind of uh, an array. And for those of you joining in that aren't uh, uh, into rock art or uh, figurative rock art just means it depicts something. Uh, and and uh, there's a tremendous array at these sites in the Serrania La Lindosa of figurative forms like anthropomorphs, human forms, uh, and zoomorphs, which is just a fancy term for animals. Uh, and you don't often get such a combination. Some places you do, but this is a pretty stunning example. Um, there's lots of different animals that are portrayed in the rock art. I'm hesitant to interpret, but there's depictions of jaguars, tapirs, capybaras, uh, maybe panthers, deer, 
bats, monkeys, turtles, all sorts of different things. Uh, some more realistic than others. There's, uh, here's another example, uh, geometric motifs like we have here uh, and here along with animals is kind of a really common theme in the Serrania La Lindosa. Um, there's also a lot of handprints. These are positive handprints. I've talked to Steve Frears. He believes these are, are probably male, um, but you get handprints at almost all of these uh, sites. So um, interestingly, when you look at the viral publicity that came out about these sites, most of it was Sarah Azul and, and this site. And you can see why the media would use this beautiful rock art example, rock art complex as clickbait for the article. But a lot of the times, even when they were talking about other sites, um, the articles would show photographs of Sarah Azul. So this is the second big concentration of rock art, Nuevo Tolima. And over here is the main shelter uh, right here. And uh, there's also rock art here. And then there's another site down here. And I think one or two more sites around the corner to the left. So it's a big site complex to be sure. So, um, this is a uh, thanks to Hebrew for a drone the photo. Have been up there. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so this is a drone photo from Hebrew, and you can see individual people. It's a little bit unclear at the big site here, so that provides uh, some some nice perspective. Um, then this is the um, uh, the main panel at uh, this site, um, the largest of them. And you can see there's an extreme density of paintings. Um, uh, and, and it's pretty clear there's overpainting and this was not one uh, painting event. Um, this is, uh, there's also in the way the Tulima, like you can see here, there's some more dominant images, larger images that you don't see so much as like at Serizul. Here's a close up. Uh, this is a human-like figure, an anthropomorph, and a feline figure, probably a jaguar, but it's hard to know for sure. There's a huge variety, like at the other sites, the figurative and non-figurative uh, rock art, along with these geometric patterns, like you see here. Large dominant animals, it's hard to say for sure what this lar largest one is in this image. Uh, I think it might be a capybara, a capybara, but it's, I, I've heard somebody also say it's a taper. I, again, don't like to interpret, so I don't know for sure. We did see tapers on this trip. This is actually a baby taper, just several months old. Uh, tapers get to be as big as six and a half feet tall and weigh almost, uh, they can weigh up to 400 pounds. So they're big, big animals. Uh, Nueva Tolima just, uh, it's, it's endless with its high density of paintings. Uh, it's really an exquisite combination of representational uh, and, and non-representational figures. There's lots of large humans. Some are sideways like up here. Here's one that's upside down. The site also has a large amount of bird images as you can see here along with the geometrics, um, more humans, birds, geometrics, a common theme for the sites in this area. Here's a close-up of the bird at the bottom that I just think is, is really an unbelievably impressive bird image. Um, more examples of humans, geometrics, and, and birds and other animals. And then this, may be a therianthrope, um, which is just, uh, for those that don't know, a combination, a figure that has a combination of human and animal-like traits. There's many in the world that are much more obvious, but this one looks like it could possibly fall into that category. So this is a site, another site at Nueva Tolima that's much more faded, but it had, it was the site here of dating uh, way before the team that, uh, it, uh, that made the alleged discovery that I'm going to be talking about 
am talking about that, that went viral. So another team years ago did dating at this site and Judith and Carlos uh, provide, provide the scale. So back to the upper level at Cerro Pinturas, uh, which is really impressive. And this is another photo for Hebrew. You can see a person down here on the bottom right to provide scale. And this is really, I think, one of the largest sites in the world. It's many hundreds of feet. It's as big as Cueva Pintada in Baja. I think it's as big as the Huishan site in China. It's just a really large site. And it's almost continuously painted, but there's some concentrations that, uh, that Hebrew has given different names to. So you have the Sara Azul site down here, and then this is just a portion of the upper layer up on this part. So this is one of the first concentrations to give you an idea of what it looks like. Here's a little video context and you can tell it's very densely painted, uh, uh, lots of overpainting in the red areas and then other individual figures. So this is one of the concentrations uh, in that upper ledge. And again, it's got some dominant figures like this anthropomorph that looks different than any of the other anthros that we saw at any of the other sites. It, it, uh, there's also a large array of handprints and then geometrics. And so each of these sites are all kind of similar but look different in many ways. And so this is the Los Dantes portion of the site. And this is a huge panel. Again, lots of figurative and non-figurative rock art. Um, another uh, point that I always try to make is this is probably non-figurative, but you never know. It might have been figurative to the people that made it, and we just don't know what, uh, what it means and consider it to be non-figurative. So this is more of this site, and these animals are pretty interesting. Take a look at the paws or feet. Um, that does not appear to be naturalistic. It's stylized in some way, and you see it on some of the animals, especially at this site, but some of the other ones. Uh, this is a close-up. Uh, Fernando Urbina, uh, he had written that he believed these were depictions of war dogs that the Spanish used to attack the indigenous population. I'm not sure what the basis for that is. I'm not sure if there is a good basis for that, but he, he has his reasons for that take. But again, it's got uh, stylized uh, paws or feet. And you see that with other animals, like this probably is a monkey, though I don't know, but again, it's got kind of these stylized, non-naturalistic uh, feet, and you see that a lot. So more of the Los Dantes panel here, rows of, of probable anthropomorphs, human-like figures with upraised arms, probably arms. Upraised arms are common in many parts of the world, such as, say, uh, the great mural region of Baja, Mexico and other areas. And it's pretty common in the Amazon, though this is really a tremendous and unique example. Um, here you have what might be from the palms of hands, uh, stylized images, or they could be a stamp made from some other material. But again, just an array of, of representational and non-representational images. Same with this. And again, it really is pretty clear this was not one painting event. There's overpainting, and these were made at different points in time, which becomes important uh, in a few minutes. Um, here's another portion of that panel, which are probably deer, deer are common in this part of the world and in the Amazon in general. Here's a close-up of that panel. So those who don't study rock art, these sites are big and have an extreme density, unlike a lot of rock art around the world. These are not typical sites. And so I lies paws or feet and a similar image uh, here. So then let's look at the Rudal site which is the third of the complex. Um, and again, it's similar but different, uh, as you'll see in a moment. 
uh, a lot of handprints, a lot of geometrics. Um, so you have to go where we went to this site by boat. This was our, in particular, leaky boat. Uh, this gives a little bit of context uh, about going up the river. Um, we uh, got caught in a torrential downpour on the way back. I wasn't thinking it was going to rain, but I should have. So this site, like I said, like many of the others, has a lot of handprints, and they're these stylized handprints, often that have designs in them that were uh, made, which is interesting. And you see that in other parts of the world. So it's somewhat common, but it's certainly not what you see all the time in rock art. Um, this is one of the major uh, panels at, at Rudol. Uh, and you get, again, one of these large kind of dominant animals, probably a taper, but again, I, I'm not sure. And I don't like to interpret with any uh, degree of definiteness. Um, this site, I believe more than any of the others had a higher degree of geometrics. There's still a large amount of figurative rock art at Rudolph, but it seemed like geometrics were really um, the most prevalent form. Um, we were told these are probably monkey figures, which makes sense. I think that looks like a monkey. I don't know. I'm not going to say for sure, but it's kind of a neat thing because when we were here, a troop of monkeys came through the canopy above us and behind us uh, uh, in the trees, which was really quite nice. And then this is an example, more geometrics. And then this is a, a large panel that's up on an upper ledge. And um, you can actually see too some metal that had been put up because of uh, protecting the site from visitors, which kind of goes against the idea that these were just recently discovered. Uh, but I'll talk about that more in just a minute. So one of the things the people that wrote that Quaternary International article claimed, and others have claimed, is that these sites in the Serrania La Lindosa are related to figures in Brazil, specifically Serra de Capivara. And I, I think if you look at them, they may have a general relevance, a general similarity, but I kind of am not on board with that idea. Serra de Capivara is a long way away. It's not really in the Amazon. It's in a biome called the Caatinga. Uh, and also, I think when you look beyond the general similarities, it's, it's really quite different rock art. And I am, yeah, oh, there we go. Uh, so there are jaguars uh, in, in Brazil, but this one is a lot more realistic than at least the ones, I think, in uh, the Serrania La Lindosa. Though Chiribiketi, just south of the Serrania La Lindosa, has some incredible jaguar images that are very realistic. Um, in, in the Serra de Capivara, you get a lot of pairing uh, uh, and, and uh, figures are arrayed with each other that you don't see in the Serrania La Lindosa that tends to be more haphazard. There are also multiple styles identified in the Serra de Capivara like this. This is the Serra Branca style and it is typified by these large anthropomorphs that are paired together that are just beautiful and then little human-like anthropomorphic figures off to the side. And there's nothing that I'm aware of like that in the Serrania La Lindosa. So I think it's always important to think about the indigenous people uh, because they're the ones that made the rock art and they're the ones whose land the rock art was made on and that they've been displaced from. And so we were lucky enough through Hebrew who knew an anthropologist working with indigenous people to go to this camp where some are living now, which um, was a little bit sad. These people definitely had been displaced, but they identified with the rock art sites and had visited the rock art sites and identified with them as being their own. They now make beautiful baskets. You can see one over here that I bought. I bought several. I feel very lucky because they're just gorgeous. And they, they showed us how they make the vegetable dyes that they use for the basketry and the other stuff that they're making. And so they make pigment sticks with these vegetable uh, dyes. And here's an example of that. And John Greer pointed out that in the Orinoco and in a lot of parts of the Amazon, rock art is made with vegetable dyes and that that's quite common. Here, and I'll show you in a few minutes, 
the Hebrew people used XRF and they had verified that the, the, the paintings on the Serrania La Lindosa were mineral pigments, which also the, the Quaternary International Journal team that uh, I'm discussing, they also had that same belief. Okay, back to the Ice Age claims of, of Ice Age rock art. So the original paper that started all of the hyperbole is this paper. And it's Morcote, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Rios, Morcote Rios et al. They're, they're the authors of this Quaternary International paper. And they're a team of British and Colombian archeologists. Though they're, as far as I can tell, not rock art specialists, their uh, expertise or, or specialty area is the peopling of America. And whoops, what they did is they did excavations and they did excavations at three locations, one at Sierra Azul, but then at two small rock art sites uh, that were not major rock art sites. So they did these three sets of excavations and then they analyzed what they found in the excavations and they found that occupation uh, went back, human occupation to 12,600 before present but it also went up to 300 years ago. And it wasn't exactly continuous. There were some gaps, but basically people had left things that were found in the excavations from 300 years ago to 12,600 years ago. And as far as I know, nobody criticizes their excavations or those claims. And in fact, my understanding is those claims are entirely consistent with other excavations, both in Colombia and some that had occurred in the Amazon. So this was good work on excavations, but not really all that new information other than it was new for the Serrania La Lindosa. The problem and the controversy that has occurred has been they're applying those dates to the rock art and particularly claiming that the rock art is dated to 12,600 years ago into the Ice Age. And their claim that they discovered the rock art, which isn't in the journal article, but it is in a press release I'll talk about. And then the controversy is also about the claim that the rock art includes depiction of megafauna. And they claim that it's based, that it's megafauna from the Ice Age in part because they claim that there's impressive realism to some of the images that they found that I'm gonna show. So what is megafauna? Uh, megafauna is basically big animals that roam the earth during the Pleistocene from 1.6 million to 10,000 years ago. And so examples most people are familiar with would be mastodons, mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, giant ground sloths, cave bears, et cetera. And we have some megaphones, rhinos, uh, and a few others. So the controversy with this article really relates to their claims of megafauna. And they, out of tens of thousands of images that they claim to have seen, they have six examples they say are megafauna. And this is a direct uh, uh, screen capture from their article. This is their proof, these six photos. And right off the bat, I have questions and other people have questions about this as supporting such a substantial claim. And I'm not saying they have uh, had any negative intent or were trying to intentionally misrepresent anything, but I and many others have uh, expressed concerns about whether these have a scientific basis. And so right off the bat, it appears they're cherry picking out of, they say tens of thousands of images, they're cherry picking these six out of all of those images when these are really quite crude, they're small when you see them in context, when I'll show you in a minute, they don't really stick out and they're not prominent motifs at all. And so that's really a concern. Um, so, I've heard at least several people say, oh, the hyperbole came from the media and not from the authors. And that's a little bit true, but it's not mostly true. In fact, a lot of the media hype came directly from the authors from the original article and then in interviews after it was published, which I'll show in just a second. But also, 
a couple of days after the hype started, the University of Exeter, which is where the British portion of the team was at, on 1130, they put out a press release. And instead of correcting the hype that was coming out, they sort of supported it and reset it, set it and doubled down on it. And for instance, that press release said the rock art was allegedly newly discovered by the researchers during their landscape surveys, which it was not. It said the rock art included depictions of people interacting with huge creatures, including mastodons. I'm not convinced, and I'll explain in a minute. And they also said the pictures show how people would have lived amongst giant, now extinct animals, which they hunted. So let's look at that. This is that press release, just to show you. It came out, and um, in my mind, they could have, right when that press release came out, they could have stop some of the hyperbole. They could have clarified and said, we didn't discover the rock art, or we're not sure it's Ice Age, and we're not sure it's, it's uh, you know, megafauna, as I'll show in a minute, but they didn't. And, and so that was a chance to kind of quell some of that, and they did not take that. Instead, for instance, one of the team members, Jose Iriarte, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right, in The Guardian, one of the first articles to come, come out, he said, uh, when you're there, your emotions flow. I'll agree with that. It's, it's an amazing place. We're talking about several tens of thousands of paintings. I don't know if that's, it's that many, but I'll take him at his word. It's going to take generations to record them. Well, that's interesting because Hebrew had already been recording them for several years that I'll show you just in a minute. And they don't give any mention of the Hebrew work and Hebrew had already put out a report of hundreds of pages in 2018 about their recording efforts. So then he says, we started seeing animals that are now extinct. Huh. The pictures are so natural and so well made that we have few doubts that you're looking at a horse, for example. It's so detailed, we can even see the horse hair. Okay, let's look. Let's see if you agree with those comments. Um, so these are their two horse claims. This is it. So E, I really have trouble with. That to me isn't anything. That is not impressive realism. I don't think it looks anything like a horse. It could, it could be almost anything. D, I think if you hadn't gotten the suggestion that it was a horse, you probably wouldn't think it's a horse. And if you viewed it in the context of the whole wall of paintings, you might not think it's a horse. But let's just say it's a horse. What makes it a megafauna horse from the Ice Age? There's been European contact and horses, and I'll talk about this a little more. And I sure as heck don't see impressive realism, and I sure as heck don't see the horse hair. Um, if you want impressive realism, Aboriginal, Indigenous people are quite capable of doing that, and they do it in many contexts around the world. This is from Arizona. If you want to see realism, I think this is a better example. If you want to see horse hair, uh, I think these are much clearer horses. Uh, how about let's look at Game Pass in South Africa. Uh, if you, this isn't a horse, it's an eland, but if you want to see hair on an animal, indigenous people are able to do that if they want to. Another example uh, is from France, and you can see much greater realism than what these two lone images are out of tens of thousands that this team is making their, their claim about Ice Age horses. So let's talk about the specific points that have been raised in the issues and, and whether they really have a scientific basis. So issue one, there is not eight miles of Ice Age rock art. There's not eight, eight miles of any aged rock art. These sites are miles apart from each other. And what's so weird to me about this is these are some of the biggest sites in the world. They didn't need to be hyped about how large they were. They, nobody needed to claim they were eight miles of a continuous freeze. And in all fairness, this particular claim didn't really come from the team. This is more a media-based uh, one of the problems. Um, next, this team, this is not a new discovery. 
This team did not discover this rock art. And uh, this rock art has been known for a long time, this corpus of rock art. So it was first mentioned in references going back to 1952. There are multiple other references over the years, but mostly in Spanish. And Judith Trujillo of Hebrew has commented on a bit of a colonialistic aspect to this. Um, she said in an email to the Rock Art Listserv, because, and she's referring to the earlier literature and reports, because the reports appear in Spanish, it is as if they did not exist. Europe is still discovering America. And then there's the Hebrew report starting in 2017. They recorded 13 panels in all three of the large complexes uh, once the truce with the FARC had occurred. And I'll show you that report. And then the Serrania La Lindosa as a whole received governmental protection in 2018 as part of World Heritage Protection for the neighboring Chiribiketi National Park. And the Colombian president even flew in with a helicopter and there are pictures of him in front of the panel. Tourists have been going to some of these sites since that point. So the authors did not discover this. It appears they may have found three smaller panels with the aid of local guides. Uh, and that's great. So these are some examples of the literature that existed on these sites before this new discovery. This goes back, Gearbrandt 1952 has photos of Rudal. There's been other books. There's a Chiribiketi book that just came out in 2019 with a lot of pictures of the Serrania La Lindosa, and that work goes back to the 90s. This is Hebrew's report, and it's a great report. And, and it's multidisciplinary with other groups, including a geology group and a national archaeological investigation group. And so these, uh, the, the Morcote Rios people, they did excavations, but they didn't do any work on the rock art at all. They looked at the rock art, but they didn't do rock art work. These people did a ton of work on recording rock art. They did, this is XRF pigment analysis, determining what the pigments were made. Here's Judith in the field uh, with, with her laptop and other people doing work. Uh, they did conservation assessments. They did systematic documentation. Um, this is some of their recording uh, work. So they were doing all of this before this alleged discovery was made. Um, so the next issue, and this is a big one, I think. Issue three, problems with the dating. And point one is just a huge issue. This team did not do any direct dating of the paintings at all. And even worse, it appears from their own comments, they didn't even know that rock paintings could be dated. So Mark Robinson, one of the team members on this Channel 4 documentary, they talked to him and he's talking about dating at about carbon 14. But he says the one type of dating method, he says the one that most people know is carbon dating, but the biggest problem is there's no carbon involved. We're looking at ochre on these walls. There's a real problem for us. Well, that was the old view many years ago that you couldn't date rock paintings because there was no carbon, but that's changed. And I believe Karen Steelman's on tonight and she is a world expert on how to date paintings like this with the plasma oxidation technique. And it was developed by Marvin Rowe and others back in the 90s where it, they used uh, getting samples out of the binders in the paint to get the carbon and to date it. And, and in fact, Karen gave a talk on this for this Aurora talk, just like I'm giving several months ago. And I don't know, maybe Aurora should send an email to these authors telling them that yes, you can date uh, paintings. And it's not 100%. Sometimes there's problems with contamination or something like that. But I'm confident with all the images down there, if Karen Steelman or some other dating expert went, she could get dates to prove or disprove whether these are really Ice Age paintings or not. And then there's other methods. Uranium thorium is, is very important in rock art dating right now. You've probably all been aware of the dates that have come out of Sulawesi in Indonesia over the last five years. It's the team uh, from Australia 
uh, from Griffith and they used uranium thorium. And they just recently in the last month or so came out with dating of a pig as the old, a pig painting in a cave in Sulawesi indicating it's the oldest image uh, that's ever been dated in the world at 45,500 years ago. And OSL is used a lot uh, and in Australia to date, the Guion Guion paintings at being around 12,000 years old. Those two methods provide minimum dates, not of the actual paintings. And the OSL, you have to have like a bee's nest or something, wasp nest that you take off because it, it uh, focuses on uh, quartz crystals uh, in the rock and uh, uh, decay rates about them being exposed to the sun. Um, but those are valid methods that are being used around the world. For instance, the uranium thorium, they date accretions that appear on paintings and form over time. So it's a minimum date, meaning when did that accretion, accretion occur and the paintings could actually be much older. But this team just seemed, it appears they did not know anything about these dating methods and no direct dating was done whatsoever. Second point. So this is also a, a problem, a big problem. So the way they're trying to date or claim these old dates is proximity and, and inference. And, and basically they're saying, well, uh, people were here 12,600 years ago and then there's the paintings. So they must have been done at the same time. But it's 101, rock art 101 that you can't date rock art just from proximity, unless like there's a layer covering a piece of the rock art panel or something like that. For instance, Linnea Sundstrom from Arara in her great book, Storied Stone says, even if datable material is found in excavations at a rock art site, there's usually no guarantee these materials were left behind at the same time the rock art was made. They could be earlier or later. And what's also very interesting, why are these authors picking the oldest, the basal date of 12,600? Why weren't, even if you could uh, extrapolate the excavations to the paintings, why is it the oldest date that they use? Why isn't it the 300 years ago date or 1,000 years ago? And Robert Bednarik in his Rock Art Science book, he, he talks about using proximity as being akin to reading tea leaves or animal entrails, which also results in occasionally valid predictions. And there's even been studies about why proximity is seductive. It, it, it kind of makes sense that you could use it, but it's really not logically valid. And there's a study from Australia with Joe Flood about that from the 80s. And basically it boils down to, in a lot of cultural contexts, rock art production is segregated. It's in a different place from habitation and domestic activities. And they don't necessarily relate to one another. There's not necessarily a correlation with occupational pres presence. So it appears they're cherry picking the oldest dates. I just kind of mentioned this. Why are they inferring the oldest dates and not other dates within that 300 years to 12,600 year date range? Also, as I said before, these sites don't involve a single painting occurrence. It doesn't make sense that they're all 12,600 years ago. These sites seem to exhibit overpainting and, and uh, uh, painting made uh, over a long period of time. Issue four problems with the megafauna claims. Uh, point one, we sort of just talked about, meaning the claim about the megafauna is based on improper dating claims uh, and the idea that the dates go back 12,600 years. Point two is a huge one. The authors admit their own claims are speculations, though that sure didn't show up in the hyperbole in, in all the articles or the author's own interviews, did it? So if you read their paper, when they talk about megafauna, I found a key sentence. And, and in that area, they end up saying more research is needed to provide support to these speculations. 
boy, if it's just speculation, then maybe don't publish these claims in an international journal. Or if you need more research before they're not speculation, maybe do the research before you publish these claims in an international journal. And again, when all the hyperbole started, did they come out and say, well, hey, they're just speculation. We need to do more research. No, nothing like that. They went on the Channel 4 documentary, at least one of them, and, and these claims are now circulated and everybody around the world that's read them seems to think they're true. So point three, interpretation is a hazardous activity. So interpreting the meaning of rock art is a very difficult thing, but even just interpreting and identifying what a motif depicts, like a horse or something, is really a hazardous thing that that is difficult and people get wrong all the time. And some people very, are very good at interpretation, like Larry Lowendorf, uh, Jim Kaiser, Linnea Sundstrom, but they usually do things involving informed and formal methods as described in the literature. Um, but it, it's still, when people look at something and go, you know, they look at a squiggly line and go, it's a snake. It might be a snake, but it might just be a squiggly line. And people bring their own baggage to motif identification. And experts are often not usually better. And there's a great example that I've been researching for the book I'm working on with a guy named Graham McIntosh in Australia. And he was a rock art expert and he went to this site and he recorded it and identified all these different animals and said, this is that animal, that's that animal, these are these certain kind of people. And then he found out a famous researcher, A.P. Elkin had been to the site with local Aboriginal people who had knowledge of the site. So he went back 20 years later and he saw what what the information was from the Aboriginal people. And he concluded that his earlier assessment, even though he was a trained anatomist, was 90% wrong. He said 90% of his motif identifications he had gotten wrong. And he basically said, it's very difficult for people to ever even identify the motifs, let alone the meaning, if they don't have Aboriginal or Indigenous input from the culture who uh, helped make the rock art. And another example of this comes from Bednarik, where, where there were 11 rock art experts who looked at four motifs in Russia. And one of the motifs was called disc-like. And they asked 11 experts, uh, what, uh, what is that motif? Not what does it mean, just what is it? And the 11 experts said, uh, one was full moon, one was a lake, one was a clan sign, one was a trap, one was lunar symbol, Another was mirror and another was dividers. And for those playing at home, lunar symbol was the number one answer. And so, you know, if you can't, there's, there's problems and, and it's, it's often difficult to really identify motifs. Sometimes it's easy. And Bednarik also makes, and I don't agree with everything in his book, but a good point he makes is a lot of times motif um, uh, identifying motifs is a form of auto-suggestion, and it really tells us more about the viewer. It's a sort of Rorschach test than what it tells us about rock art. And the last point about this is, if you don't know what it is, just say you don't know, or say it's a maybe, but we shouldn't carry motif identifications too far, which is what I believe some of this, uh, ha what happened uh, with some of these claims. So back to their claims. Their first one is a giant sloth. And they say these two figures are a giant sloth. And they have two reasons why this is a giant sloth from the Ice Age. And one is their dates, which we've already discussed, though they certainly never dated this. But the other argument is, well, look how big the sloth is compared to these little people next to it. But there's a big problem with that. And that's that rock art is not to scale. And anybody who studies rock art will see lots of examples of this. So this is from Las Gil in Africa, and it's a cow. So is this a giant megafauna cow that's, I don't know, 15, 20 feet tall? I don't think so. It's just the way people depicted, Aboriginal people sometimes depicted things in rock art, and it's not to scale. This is from Brazil, from Serra de Capivara. Um, is this a giant megafauna deer? I don't think so. It's just the way rock art gets depicted sometimes. 
And then back to the Serrania La Lindosa, the authors can't have it their, their own, uh, can't have it both ways. Are these birds next to these human-like figures, are they giant megafauna? Are they meant to be 20, 30 foot tall birds? They don't identify it in their sex examples of megafauna. So um, with the giant sloth, this is what a giant sloth look like. And take a look at the tail. The tail is a major feature. Um, and so thank you to Ken Hedges for this. Um, he created this. And so the red is the giant sloth uh, that's proposed by the authors versus the white of a real giant sloth. So I'm not even convinced this is a giant sloth. It might be, or a sloth at all. Uh, it might be, but it sure might just be a maybe and just some kind of four-legged creature. It sure is not, to me, meeting the standard of impressive realism that the authors claim. And then even if it's a sloth, if you grant it's a sloth, there are sloths in South America and in the Amazon now. So what makes it an ice age megafauna giant sloth compared just to a sloth? So I don't think that meets the scientific rigor of a claim to be published in an international journal claiming findings of ice age rock art and megafauna. Okay, the next claim, we've talked uh, about, I guess the next one is the mastodon claim. So and this is one of the most sensationalized ones in the media. So B is their claim of a painting of a mastodon. I do not think this constitutes impressive realism. To me, this is a very crude example and can be pretty much anything. And also, again, out of tens of thousands of images, if there was really mastodons walking around, would you only get one out of tens of thousands of images? And then if you look at it, it's even less convincing if you look at it in context. Look at this. This is their mastodon. And so if you're there, remember the Iriarty quote about walking around and having no doubts that you're seeing Ice Age megafauna? I just do not get it. And it gets worse. So the authors claim that the other thing that made this for sure, or in their opinion, megafauna uh, and an Ice Age mastodon is they claim that there was a protuberance, a bump on the head that they said is the sign of a mastodon. And I don't know as I really see the bump on here, but here's the problem. Mastodons don't have the bump. It's mammoths uh, that do here. And so these are mastodons and kind of like elephants, they don't have the bump. And my reading and what I've learned is that mammoths were not in this part of the world anyway. Uh, they, they only came as far south, I believe, as Costa Rica from what I could find. Okay, so their next claim was a long neck, three-toed ungulate, a, a hoofed creature, hooven creature with a trunk. And that made them think of two different Ice Age animals. So I just do not see why they think that is what's depicted in this F photo. To me, this could be anything. And, and I don't know, but why isn't this a bird? Why is this necessarily an ungulate? Uh, what is it? And they also claim it's got three toes, but I noticed Ken Hedges looked in, in his and Amy Gilbrey's excellent article, he pointed out the back leg, one has two toes and the other has no toes. So again, it's a crude, not, not naturalistic image, and I think it could be anything. And then we've already talked about the claims of the horses, basically, I don't think they are horses or this one, at best, if it's a horse, why is it an Ice Age horse and not just a horse of, of the Spanish or somebody else that was painted in the last 300 years? And then their final claim is this one, they claim C is an Ice Age camelid. And to me, I again, is that really impressive realism depicting an Ice Age camel? Is, uh, camel? Why isn't that just a deer? Why isn't it just some other ungulate that now lives in the, the, the jungle? And what proves it's from the Ice Age as opposed to deer that live there now? I'm just not convinced by that. And again, I think if you look at the photo in context, a photo that I took, why would you think that's an Ice Age camel? And again, 
What about this bird? Is that bird megafauna? It's as big or bigger. Uh, so I just think when you look at it in context, these really appear to lack a good basis to cherry pick out of tens of thousands of years. So I'm almost done, just a few more points. I think this is a big point. So they claim in their article multiple times that the megafauna was hunted by the people that made the rock art. They say the extensive rock art not only hints at the coeval presence of humans and megafauna in the landscape, but also that mega herbivores were a component of the hunter's diet. Then why didn't you find that in the excavations you did? Because if you look at the article, their article of what they dug up and what they found was the diet of these people, they found uh, bones and plant remains, including palm and tree fruits, fish, alligators, snakes, frogs, rodents, and armadillos. So if this was really megafauna, why wouldn't you find the megafauna in the archeological remains that they excavated? Um, they also claim that the rock art required special ladders to make because it was so high, and people have claimed that the ladders are depicted in the rock art. I don't see anything that look like ladders in the rock art or people climbing on ladders. Your mileage may vary. Indigenous people are capable of making ladders if they want to with impressive realism. There's a, some great examples in Utah, like in Comb Ridge. And I, I am not opposed to the idea that ladders or scaffolding was used. It's quite possible, but we were also told by our guides that their kids could climb up to these other levels and had done so and had climbed the tree and come from the side. So the scaffolding or, or uh, ladders idea is possible, but I don't, I don't think it's clear. And I certainly didn't see anything. I see geometric forms, but not depictions of ladders. Um, one argument that's been made that I believe a lot and feels is a good argument is these paintings are in too good a condition with such a wet environment uh, to be so old. I think that's probably true. I agree with it, but I will say in the author's favor, there's examples from around the world where rock art can be in pretty wet environments and still be 12,000 years old. This is a, a, a Guion Guion site uh, from the Kimberley in Australia. So it's possible. Um, don't just believe me. I am not aware of any rock art specialist who has agreed with the megafauna claims or the date claims and notable individuals and groups have spoken out against them. Hebrew certainly has. They called the viral claims uh, scandalous, exaggerated, imprecise, and baseless. So it's clear where they stand. Diego Martinez Celis, who's an excellent rock art researcher from Colombia, he said these claims do a weak favor to the scientific approach. Uh, John Greer uh, said in an email to the rock art listserv, there are no megafauna depicted in these or any sites in southern Colombia or anywhere in the Orinoco drainage. Amy Gilreath and Ken Hedges did just a week or two ago a great article that's in La Pintura called Color a Skeptical, where they go over many of these claims. And then Eckhart Malaki, who I talked to recently, and as many of you know, we had our own um, controversy about uh, a megafauna in the United States. He made the argument that uh, two depictions near Bluff, Utah were mammoth. He made a bunch of cogent arguments in favor of that. Other people disagreed and geologists and different people have disagreed, but that's a legitimate controversy. And, and uh, when, I, when I communicated with him, he said my uh, three-year-old granddaughter could draw a better mastodon than what they're claiming in this journal article is a mastodon. And he said it was okay to share that. Um, lastly, Diego uh, Martinez Celes, uh, uh, Put out what I thought was just a genius thing to the listserv uh, a couple days ago. Probably many of you have seen it. He just completely flipped the claims 
uh, and reverse them. So uh, he, he, in the article, said that hunter-gatherers believed the frescoes were created by late sedentary hominids that populated the Mediterranean Europe around the mid-15th century. He also uh, commented that the detailed naturalism is surprising and indicates, I just love this, a high degree of primitivism because they just copied what they saw. And, uh, and then he lastly had said the indigenous explorers from the Amazon would be venturing further into Europe, looking for the reasons why art in Europe had declined to uh, the level of extreme naturalism. So in conclusion, the dissemination of inaccurate info, uh, information around the world is really troublesome and, and viral spreading of information is really troubling in our modern times. And it's not just politics, it now seems to be seeping into everything in our world, including rock art. So we, we always and always have needed to be skeptical about things, but we should examine claims, especially on the internet, examine uh, clickbait with skepticism and be careful before we forward things on or claim that it's accurate. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. This is a great presentation. Not only uh, did we get to see some fantastic rock art, I mean, there's nothing unamazing about what you showed, but I think your analysis um, gave us a lot to uh, think about in terms of uh, contrast to what we've been reading about in the press. So that was really useful. Um, so this is a time uh, where people can now type their questions into chat if they haven't already. And um, I suspect there uh, will be lots of questions. So I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, read through some of them for you, Jeff. Okay. So, um, here's one um, asking about the background. So um, the question is, is that a limestone substrate that the paintings are placed on? Has the white background been geochemically analyzed? And is there any theory uh, if that is the natural rock or did the artist do some preparation on the background before painting? So Hebrew has looked at that a lot. And my understanding is it is sandstone. It's Cretaceous sedimentary rock. And I've heard some people say there's some preparation on the background uh, and others not. So I, I don't know about that. It's not super apparent that that was done, but a lot of the rock really does have a whitish characteristic to it that makes the paintings really pop. And that would be the, so you think that's natural uh, white, not any pigment itself? I'm going to say I'm not sure, but I have no reason to believe it's pigment. Okay. And, and I would defer mm -hmm. to a geologist. And Hebrew, when they did their multidisciplinary report, they had geologists involved. And that was one of the things they definitely looked at. Mm -hmm. And also, as long as we're talking about preparation, um, is there any evidence of scaffolding or anything that, that indicates how, they, how people might have gotten up there? You know, in, um, in the rock itself? I mean, I've heard that some people say they see in the rock art scaffolding and people climbing it. I, I don't. It wouldn't shock me. I, I know there's been a lot of theories regarding the big sites in Baja, the great mural sites and other places of using ladders, scaffolding, or uh, some people have theorized holding up like palms and long poles to paint with. Though I always wondered how well could you do it when you're projecting that far off from your hand. Um, so I don't doubt that at all. There's some great images in the U.S. of ladders, though I think it's more people going up to habitation sites. So I don't disbelieve that, but I'm not aware of any evidence of it, like the finding of a ladder at the base of the panel or finding some scaffolding. And do you get the impression uh, being there that uh, there was a place for an audience to view it from? Do you think it was set up for an audience, given that it was so high? Um, not all of the panels are up that high. Um, Nueva Tolima definitely has a large place where many people could gather. Sierra Azul, pretty large. Nueva Tolima is huge uh, and, and a big area where people could be gathering around. Come on. 
Uh, would you please, anybody please mute yourself um, so that we don't get uh, distracting noise? Um, okay, here's another question. Uh, given the long history of consumption of coca leaves by the indigenous peoples, do you see any evidence of uh, that in rock art imagery, for example, images resembling the Poporo? Which I believe I, is a I don't, but but I'm not I'm not saying that didn't happen. I mean, there's there's a lot of literature and hypotheses around the world about people using drugs to potentially inspire rock art production, um, and and so that that seems possible to me. But I have no reason. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know. Yeah, and, and no um, examples of plants around the base of them that would indicate um, the use of any particular substances? I would not have known which plants would be good for that type of thing, and I wouldn't have noticed. I, I didn't notice that. Yes, that might be something for the, uh, the research team to look into. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so we had some questions about the pigments. Um, you already talked a little bit about that. I don't know if you have anything else to share in terms of what is known about the pigments. I really don't. I, I know um, wh what I had said before, but I, I believe uh, Hebrew covered it with their XRF um, investigation. That was one of, the, one of the primary things that they were doing. And you could see them doing in some of the photographs that I showed. Yeah, so some of the images are very faint, right? So some of them look like they're more aged than the other ones. Um, were there differences in the pigments between the ones that look fainter versus, you know, the orange ones versus the, the more dark reddish ones? I think potentially that's true. Um, I, I definitely don't think they're single painting episodes. And I, I know John Greer uh, made points about that uh, on the listserv and with us about, and, and you know, my guess is Hebrew didn't uh, analyze every single painting at every one of these sites. So could there be some non-mineral paint? I'm, I'm not here to say there's not. Um, and, and it certainly seems like there could be different types of, of pigment used at the sites. And things change in their color over time as well, as I'm sure most, most people watching know. Um, yeah, so I do recall from the paper that they did mention finding some pigment in the excavation and they dated that, I think, to 12,000, which may be where they made that leap of faith to jumping to the pigment on the on the uh, cliff walls. So do my reading any... of the paper is that that's not at all clear. They do say something about finding some pigment in their excavations. I don't recall them saying it was in the 12,600 age range, uh, but maybe I could be wrong about that, but they say very little. It's just a couple sentences and they didn't publish any data or, or specifics about it. They didn't show any photographs about it. Uh, and, you know, for instance, pigment use uh, occurred in Africa. There's sites with pigment going back at least 300,000 years old or something like that, or maybe even older that I've, I've read about recently. And pigment use in that shows up in archaeological deposits does not equal rock art. Like it can be used for lots of different things. Um, so I really think if they had solid evidence of dating the pigment or pigment like buried rock art, I, I would have expected to see more specifics, a photo, some examples, what dating layers than what is in that article. Yeah, you wonder with the dating, uh, if it were on a since we're on a cliff face, you'd expect that something would have fallen off, right, and and be uh, buried at the base, uh, or as well as there being potentially uh, pictographs below the ground level. Uh, has has anyone looked into that? I don't know if anybody's excavated, it, and I'm not sure there would be. Uh, uh, but yeah, potentially there could be rock art that spalled off over time. And that that could have been dated if that's what they really found. But it's pretty vague in their article when they talk about the pigment uh, in the excavations. Uh, but yeah. I would I would defer to like Amy Gilreath or somebody like that. And she and Ken wrote that excellent article that 
uh, is in La Pintura. Yes. Yeah, so does the rock art go all the way to the bottom, all the way to the ground level? Um, I don't. I don't recall it really going down to the ground. It goes low in places, but there's a lot of rock art there. It's it's hard to say. And uh, I uh, I was uh, I will admit to being visually overwhelmed and focusing on trying to get some photographs. Uh, and I wish I had more time and would love to go back. But I don't recall seeing it, like some sites I've seen definitely, like Cave of the Beasts in Egypt. You can tell that rock art's going down under the sand. It's very obvious things are covered. I didn't get that impression at these sites. Yeah, we can we can excuse you for being concerned about getting the photographs and missing some other things. How long did you actually uh, get to stay there and how long did it take to get there? Um, I, we, I, I was at sites for four full days in the Suwannee La Lindosa and two in the Altiplano. And then there were travel days as well. Uh huh. Um, Okay, so let's see some more questions here. So the Chiribukete that you mentioned, was that, have you visited that site as well? No, so um, nobody's really allowed there unless there's permitting. Uh, and mostly because it's believed there are several indigenous groups there that have had little or no contact with the Western world. Though I've read things about how People were in there during the, the rubber commercialization days. And, um, but it's, it's a pretty much no-go area. There was a couple of years ago, there was an option to pay $2,000 to just have a one hour flyover. Uh, but when we went, that wasn't even a possibility anymore. And there is an ability to go for an all day, super long day on bad dirt roads to get just outside of it to look. But it's a magnificent place. There's a great book on the rock art there. There's several books, but one in particular from 2019, and it has phenomenal rock art. Uh, yeah. it, it does. It's it probably a good thing that they are. Ones. It's probably a good thing for the indigenous people that they are limiting access to that one. Um, now you did uh, have a chance to interact with some indigenous peoples. Now, had they? any idea of what the uh, rock art uh, was there for? And do they have any memory of actually creating any? So I don't speak Spanish, sadly. I took Russian in college, so I wasn't directly speaking to them. Um, but the translation was something about they knew about the rock art sites, they had been there, but it wasn't a lot more specific than that. Um, so. No, we weren't told anything that they had some specific claim uh, about them or theories about them or anything like that. But they did recognize it as being something that they uh, felt was their own. Yeah, my recollection was something about we we knew said or they knew we were there to see rock art and they said, oh, we have rock art sites. And then it was translated to us that those were the sites we had been going to. So um, my understanding is they had been taken there at, at some point in time and shown the sites and they identified at least in a general way with those sites. Hmm. So another area to be explored. Um, so here's some more questions. Do you find any evidence of vertical stratigraphy in, in that, for example, the higher paintings might be older than the lower images? The so higher different. ones looked exactly the same to me as the, the lower ones. Um, and, and I had good telephoto lenses and took a lot of photos of high up rock art. And it just looked like pretty much the same thing, subject matter and appearance. Okay, and question on the, does the paint again, is it ochre or is it all vegetable matter? My understanding is it's ochre and mineral paintings and not vegetable. Though, as John Greer has pointed out, vegetable is used in the Amazon, especially like where he did his PhD. But at least the rock art that Hebrew used their XRF on, they found mineral-based paints. And, and I don't know where the uh, 
Morcade uh, Rios team got their information from, but they also said the paintings were mineral based. But I don't see any indication of them doing XRF or any kind of testing. So I don't know where they got that, but that's what they said in their article as well. Hmm. Uh, somebody asked whether the site had recently been cleared of vegetation, um, noticing that some vines were on some of the paintings. I don't know. I don't know. My guess is the jungle there grows fast and at times people are cutting things. Uh, but I, I know like, especially at Sierra Azul, there were vines hanging down and they would sway in the wind. And um, um, so I just think in that what environment, you're gonna get that kind of growth, but I don't know anything about management. There's definitely people keeping an eye on the rock art. And one of the great things Hebrew has done is Hebrew has talked to groups and there's uh, some agreements between the locals about who will take people and who gets money for guiding and things. And Hebrew had done a community outreach with them indicating like, hey, this is important stuff and it also might help make you money someday. So take care of it and value it, which is, is always really important to do with any kind of rock art conservation. And uh, for instance, the family that lived at Cerro Pinturas was very invested. And they had met, you know, they took the rock art very seriously. They had taken many people to sites there, archeologists. Uh, and, and so I think that's great work by Hebrew to um, communicate with the local people about that. Yeah, and you may have said this, what is a Hebrew, uh, what's the abbreviation for? It is um, the group for the investigation of indigenous rock art. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, here's another question. Are you aware of any ancestral belief or shamanistic practice as these at these sites? No. Just in the I, area. I don't, I don't know of any ethnography, gender related or not, regarding these sites. Hmm. It's unclear who made these sites and, and also as to what time period. I mean, my guess is these sites have been painted for hundreds or thousands of years, whether they go back 12,600, I don't know, maybe, maybe they do, but I think they've been used over time and my guess is maybe by different groups and for different reasons. And when you really look where we do have ethnography in different places, like Australia is one of the best, Sites are used for different functions at different times, different, different ceremonies, seasonally, um, men's and women's practices, but I don't know anything about any ethnography for these sites. Hmm. Um, to hear the comment, uh, are you familiar with the Cubans who traced rock art from the top of the Andes down the Amazon, uh, jumping the Orinoco and then island hopping to Cuba? Apparently they built their own canoes to simulate what the ancient peoples would have had available. Have you heard of that? I have not. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, if, 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 you'd, if the person who put that in would like to send Jeff a message, um, he might be interested in, in learning more about that. Uh, let's see what else we have. We're getting close to the end here. Um, Yeah, so what are he, what is Hebrew involved in doing now in terms of uh, further work? Are they actively seeking to date the sites or answer some of the questions that we had posed? I'm not exactly sure. I know Judith is working on her PhD regarding that area, but I'm not sure exactly what work they're doing. Yeah, okay. Well, this is this has been uh, really fascinating stuff and I, I I'm glad to uh, have. I'm glad you're able to share this because getting a firsthand account makes a huge difference. And obviously, there's a lot more that we're going to be hearing about this site uh, or this set of sites in the future. And now we have some great background for that. So thanks again, Jeff, for your presentation. Thanks to all the attendees for your interest. If you would like to learn more about what Aurora does, please check out our website and our Facebook pages. Remind you that our next talk on March 13th will be Mavis Greer on rock art in Egypt. 
Um, so until then, uh, good evening, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you.